So very good morning to my brothers and sisters here again at Bethany EFC. Uh, it's been a while, but I'm always thankful to come here. Uh, I'm your brother from the west coming to the east because uh, I live in Bukit Panjang, uh, so it's a little bit far. But I uh, thank God every time I come here because uh, I'm just thankful that every time we come, we know that uh, when we gather in Jesus' name, God has something to say to us. Amen. Uh, so let's just prepare our hearts in prayer once again as we go to God's word. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your holy word. I thank you for your scripture that uh, will speak to our hearts, to our minds, and lead us to respond to your word. Lord, help us not just to hear today, uh, but to take this word and put it into action. Let it um, inspire us. Let it encourage us. Let us stand firm. May it help us to stand firm in our faith as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, it's been some time, and today uh, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 5. Uh, when I was reading this, I realized that this is one of those verses that um, maybe when you think about it, it's a little chim. It's a little bit difficult to understand. Uh, some of us, to be honest, might read it and kind of just skip it over, say, I think I get the gist of it, uh, but let's move on. Uh, but today we're going to spend about 30 minutes on this passage, and we'll see that John's intention uh, was not to confuse, but to clarify. Uh, while he speaks a lot about commands, he's actually trying to confirm in the believer's heart what they believe and whether or not they realize um, they have certainty of their faith. Now, speaking of certainty, uh, we live in a world now of, a lot of no absolutes. We live in a world where everything is relative. It depends on who you ask, they say, about truth. So it reminds me of a time when I was trying to convince people that everything that I was selling was the best product out there. Uh, I don't know any salesmen out here, uh, but I used to be a salesman when I was 16 years old. Uh, and I was the guy at the hawker center uh, selling the perfume, the bag, the belts. Uh, and if you remember that guy, uh, I was that guy. Uh, actually, it's very good money. That's why, <laughs> that's why I was that guy. Huh? But the products I, I was selling, I was told they were good. And I tried to convince others it was good as well. So I mean, uh, that's what I'm told to say at least, and I try with as much integrity as possible to show them that it's a good product. Um, now, one uncle said these words to me one day at Tekka's market. He said, how do you know it's good? Uh, have you used it? Show it to me. And of all things I was selling that day, I was selling the app uh, Exercise Roller. And so in the oily uh, field market of Tekka, I was on my knees in the suit pants, rolling around on the floor, showing them that uh, this is a good product. You know? um, and why I share this story with you is uh, the question that the uncle asked me that day is probably a question that people ask us about our faith as well. Or you have asked yourself as well, how do I know for sure? You know, how do I know that I am saved? How can I be sure? about all these things that I hear in church, about my salvation. And is there proof that you can show me, and they're asking uh, the Apostle John now, is there proof that I can know that my faith is real and authentic? And how do I know if I am good, that I am good enough? You know, uh, many of us say that uh, we try to be good Christians, but how do we know when we've hit the so-called good enough standard? for uh, being a Christian. Now, the criteria that the church sets or the lingo that we use in church is sometimes we say that someone is born again. Now, someone who is born again, uh, how does that look like? We say that if you are born again, you are saved. Uh, as a pastor, I've learned that it's dangerous to assume. Uh, it's dangerous to assume that uh, just because you come to church, you call yourself Christian, just because you come to church activities, it does not mean you are saved. Uh, I say this because Jesus says very clearly in Matthew, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to him or to me, Jesus, on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And this is Jesus' response. He says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. You know, I've been sharing this passage very often in other churches uh, when we were talking about our faith. And I realized that sometimes uh, people who have been coming to church for a long time, uh, even doing things in church, you know, being very busy, uh, this is a warning from Jesus that just because you are busy for God doesn't mean you're close to God. Uh, I have a friend who used to boast that he has many certificates. He says, I've joined so many uh, training courses. Uh, I've been uh, certified as a training discipler. Uh, a disciple trainer, sorry. 
Uh, and uh, I realized that when I've been going to India recently, and Pastor Desmond has been going as well, they, they love to collect certificates. Uh, and um, one of the things is uh, there's a warning there that just because you have many certificates does not mean you are saved. So the question this morning we want to ask as we look into 1 John is how do we know we are saved? And, and I think there's at least two points, two very simple points, but very important points to think about. How do we know we are truly saved? And the first is uh, your life should portray joyful obedience to Christ joyful obedience. Now, when we talk about being born again, John actually uses a different terminology. He says born of God. And it was repeated in chapter 4. Now it's also in chapter 5. Let's just look at the first two verses. It says here, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. So two things are, very, are mentioned in this very short passage. Number one, believe in Jesus. Very simple, right? You are, if you're born of God, you believe in Jesus. And we will talk about that a little bit more later. What does that mean? Then the second is really our love for God and love for man. Or in this case, he says love for his children. So that's the essence of being born of God. Believing in Jesus Christ and loving God and his children. Simple enough. But how does that look like on a practical day-to-day -day level? Now, those who truly love God the Father, uh, John says you will automatically love the children, who uh, we can re refer to as our fellow believers uh, over here. So the essence is quite clear. Love God, love man, love the person beside you. Um, what's strange, though, is uh, the way John says it in chapter 5. Now, you would expect him to just say, love God by loving the children of God, and full stop, good enough, right? But here, he actually says um, that, uh, you know, uh, he says it a little bit differently, but let's go back to chapter 4 and see what he says. In chapter 4, it's more easy to understand. He says, I've given you a command. Jesus has given this command. Whoever loves God must love his brother. Very straightforward, very easy. Uh, but here he says something different. He says, we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commands. Not just loving uh, the children, but loving God and carrying out His commands. So what an interesting way to put it. Uh, why this emphasis on obedience? Uh, what's so important about being obedient when it comes to loving God and loving the other people? I think very importantly, we need to be re reminded this morning that loving God is never just a feeling. Now, loving God is not trying to find an experience or emotion toward God. Loving God is doing what He says. Now, this is quite uh, important because many people claim to love God, but we don't do what He says. We don't obey the commands found in Scripture. Uh, we live in a world where we're told that you are your own boss, you make your own decisions, and many times we make these decisions based on our feelings. In fact, the whole world of advertisement is trying to provoke a feeling, a reaction from us. Now, John reminds us an age-old truth. He says, if you love God, do what he says. If you love God, you cannot love God without doing what he has commanded us to do. And scripture tells us we need to love our neighbor. Now, I guess many of you are familiar with this verse in Matthew, which is where Jesus tells us the greatest commandment, right? Uh, let me read it to you. I'm sure you're familiar. It says, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first, the greatest commandment. And the second is like this, Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I always find it interesting because uh, most of the time, uh, the context tells us they were asking uh, Jesus to tell just the greatest commandment. Uh, tell us the single greatest commandment. And Jesus doesn't give one. He always gives two. Uh, because one cannot exist without the other. If you love God, you will love others. It's impossible to love others without truly loving God. And if you understand scripture, when you love God, obedience tells us we will love men. Uh, God says love the father and also love the children. The simple meaning is loving our fellow believers here. That's the good starting point for us. Uh, in essence, a church full of 
born again or born of God believers, we should be identified by one thing, not by our singing or our wonderful preaching, but by the amazing love we find in the church for one another. And that should be a marker for every church that claims to love God. But in theory, it's very easy. In practice, it's always very hard. I know I've struggled with this many times. Uh, early on in my ministry, I even said a prayer to God, uh, Lord, um, I love to serve you, but I really don't love the people I'm serving. <laughs> you know, I love you, but you know, the people, they started as very ai. Then after that is kalian, bu hao ai. You know, um, it's very hard because uh, people are nice until they're not. Uh, and sometimes the church is a gathering of imperfect people. And when we come together, it's easy at the beginning. But as you get to know one another, when unkind words are said, uh, it's very hard to practice this idea of loving God and also loving men. Uh, but God says, if you love God, you will obey His command to love His children. And it has to start in the church. Uh, I can't help but think of all those Chinese period dramas. Uh, do you remember those dramas? Some Korean dramas as well. Uh, even the uh, Japanese ones. Recently, there's one called Shogun. And there's this whole, whole idea where the wives and the concubines are always very nice when the husband is around. And the moment the husband goes away, uh, they're trying to backstab, uh, kill each other, and cause trouble for one another. Uh, and I wonder whether the church is like that too. That on Sunday, we say to God how much we love God the Father. But from Monday to Saturday, we forget we need to love one another. Uh, we need to love the children. Uh, and at times, it feels very burdensome. It feels like a burden to love people who are not so easy to love. But that's why we have to look at the next two verses in Scripture. It says, this is love for God to obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. Uh, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world our faith, or here it says even our faith. Now, loving others is not burdensome, uh, but some of us will say, if we're very honest, it feels like a burden. Uh, why that struggle and why that um, contradiction? You see, loving God and calling us to love others is not just blind obedience. We're not just saying, okay, God, uh, I'll love this brother uh, just because you told me to. Okay, uh, I'll listen to you, God, uh, and I'll do my best to love him, but I really don't like him. Uh, and some of us are at that stage of our lives sometimes. We love because we have no choice. Um, can you imagine a scenario where uh, I'm celebrating my seven-year anniversary, which just happened a couple days ago, and I bought flowers for my wife, and I bring it to my wife, and my wife says, oh, why did you bring the flowers to me? And I say, no choice. It's seven years. It's my duty as the husband to bring you something. Uh, if not, you'll get angry with me. That's a burden. That's out of obedience. That's out of maybe responsibility. But that's not the idea of loving God and loving man. Uh, imagine I changed that again. And when my wife asked me, why did you come and bring me flowers? I said, because I love you and because I cannot find any other better way to show you my affection. So these flowers, I purposely chose them, selected them, and they're my expression of seven years of love. Uh, I did not do that, by the way, but, but that said, isn't that amazing if you realize that it's not out of burden, out of responsibility, but out of an overflow of the love that I have for her. In many ways, loving God and loving the not-so-cute people sometimes is the overflow of our love for God. That's why it's not burdensome. He says that everyone born of God overcomes the world. Uh, have you ever thought of that? He says everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. What does that mean by overcoming the world? Remember, Jesus says that those who are born of God are those who belong to Jesus, who believe in him, who love God, love his children. And he adds one more thing now. He says they overcome the world. They are victorious. Now, what's this victory he's talking about? Uh, I want to bring you to one small verse that we love. Uh, it's short and sweet. Many of us know it. It says, we love because he first loved us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. Now, I used to think that this simply meant Jesus was a role model. Uh, we love because Jesus showed us the best example of love. Now, that's one uh, aspect of this. But in the context of uh, chapter 5, I think Jesus is not just our role model, 
but that those born of God are now empowered, we're now enabled, we're now given the ability to love as Jesus loved. We love because Jesus first loved us, and now we are capable, we're enabled, we're empowered to love. This transformation that happens in our life uh, is supernatural. And this transformation through being born again uh, is about power that defeats the world's response to hurt, to hate, to bitterness, to ugliness. The world tells us to respond an eye for an eye. The world tells us if someone treats you badly, make, them, make their life miserable. But now we overcome the world by responding in love. Now, perhaps an extreme example I once heard, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, is a Christian who went into a village uh, and heard that they had all become Christians. And he had his doubts, and he challenged their faith. Uh, and he asked the same question as um, my experience when I was a salesman. How do you know? Uh, how do I know you truly believe in Jesus Christ? How can you prove to me that your faith is real? What evidence can I see that this mass conversion of your entire village is real? And the tribal leader responded simply by saying, the proof is this. If we were not transformed, if we were not believers, you would have been our dinner menu today. Uh, and so this whole idea was this cannibalistic village uh, had a faith that expressed love in a very different way now. It was not burdensome, it was victorious because they no longer did the things of the world, but the newfound power uh, in the love of Christ caused them to change. Now, I spoke of marriage just now, uh, and I, I love this song. Um, if I've shared it with you before, let me share it again. Uh, it's called The Marriage Prayer. And one of the lyrics is so powerful. It says, help me to love you, God, more than I love her. Then I know I can love her more than anyone else. Do, do you see the logic there? It says, if we love God more than anything else in the world, we will be able, we will be empowered to love those around us more than anyone else. Uh, so John says our love for others is not burdensome because it's a newfound ability, a power in Christ when we are born of God. It is proof of our love of God when we are able to love others with this kind of supernatural love. It's also proof that we are saved. You know, when you think about how you love other people, it's a good litmus test to know whether your faith is real. You know, it's very easy to love those who love you and those who treat you nicely. But how do you treat those who respond to you unkindly or speak to you in words less than graceful? It says, who is it that overcomes the world? Uh, it is those who believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, look at verse 1. It says, everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is born of God. And we see in verse 5, it's almost like a conclusion there. It says, those who overcome the world they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So you see, when we overcome the world by loving other people, that's how we know we are saved. So back to our question, how do we know we're saved? Joyful obedience. Now this joyful, the word joyful means it's not being forced to because I must, but because I can. I'm joyful because Jesus Christ has saved me and now I am a conqueror by joyfully obeying the commands of God. That's the first point that John wants to make and make very clear to us that I would like to say it's joyful obedience, not out of duty, not out of loyalty, but love for God. Now, the second half of the passage is very interesting. Uh, it's the very chim part, actually. Uh, John goes on to talk about a basic but crucial aspect of those who are saved. Now, how do we know we are saved? I said joyful obedience. The second one is uncompromising belief. Uncompromising belief in Jesus Christ. Now, look at the next few verses and try to understand what John is trying to say. He says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by but water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. Now, if you are like me, I struggle to understand this the first time I read it. I'm like, wow, what's he trying to say? I can guess, but I'm not very sure. Uh, it's very important to remember uh, one thing when you're reading the Bible. Uh, and I've said this before, and let me say it again. The Bible was written for you, but it was not written to you. 
Uh, what do we mean by that? The Bible was written in a particular time, culture, a uh, different kind of uh, language, and it was written in a context and struggles that were very different from us. So sometimes when you're reading the passage and it gets a little confusing, always remember this. What was the context? What was the struggle that they were facing, especially when John was writing this book? Uh, John says that Jesus came by water and blood. And he even comes to emphasize something. He says he did not come by water only. Uh, why did he have to emphasize that? It, this seems to suggest that some people claim that Jesus came by water only. Um, and they, so some people agreed to one aspect about Jesus Christ, but did not agree with the other part. Uh, and that's something that uh, we're thinking about. Now, what does the water and blood represent? Uh, scholars have given a lot of ideas, but let me just suggest the most simple and easy to understand one. Now, we look at the context and we realize that um, there are some struggles in their day. Now, Gnosticism, which was the cult at that time, uh, believed that Jesus uh, might have received anointing from God during baptism, water, but that the anointing left before he died. Uh, so there's this idea that, you know, because material and flesh is evil, uh, God cannot be associated with anything like that. Uh, Docetism, which is closely related to Gnosticism, uh, emphasized an idea that Jesus was baptized, but that he was immortal because spirit, right? So he could not die, so no blood. But Greeks had an even more interesting idea. Uh, water and blood flowed from his side when he died, remember? Uh, and some of them say because of this idea uh, that G Jesus sounded more like a Greek demigod. Uh, so a lot of false teachings in this time, but Jesus Christ is not what they are saying here. And John wanted to emphasize that. If the above context that I'm explaining here is accurate, uh, and which we might never know the full picture, uh, we see that you know, John was trying to make a very important thing. He wanted them to see an accurate, a historical and a complete picture of who Jesus Christ was. Not just a little bit, but the whole of what Jesus Christ represented. The Son of God came into the world. He was the one who was baptized, who received divine approval, and he was the one who died for us for, on the cross to redeem humanity. And he says this proof by three testimonies, so to speak. Now the Spirit, the, uh, the water, and the blood. Now, if we mention these three simply, I think the Spirit uh, simply can be referring to the Holy Spirit. And uh, we look at a couple of passages together. In John chapter 1, verse 32 and 34, written by the same author, he says, John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him, Jesus, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water said, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. So John is saying, listen, this is my testimony, uh, but it's not because I claim to have any spirit, but because this is the Spirit of God who testified about Jesus Christ himself. The Spirit conveys the truth. John is conveying the truth as well. So therefore, what John's saying is, look, the Spirit has told me that this testimony is true. This is the first of three testimonies. Now, water is actually already repeated here, but let me pass you on, to, uh, bring you to another passage uh, when we talk about baptism again. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and the Spirit of God, descending like a dove, came to rest upon him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Again, it's not just John speaking, but he says the Spirit and God the Father is speaking. This is my son. So God is the testimony, uh, is the one saying the testimony here. But there's one more, right? And this is crucial to our faith, which is the blood of Jesus Christ, which we just remembered through the Lord's Supper. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split. And if I were just to read the last verse there, it says the people were filled with awe and said, 
truly this was the Son of God. So we see that at the moment of the crucifixion, uh, people were declaring, and John, Matthew, and the other authors captured this down, that this was the Son of God who shed his blood for us, who died for our sins. Uh, unlike what the cults say that Jesus did not die, that Jesus was immortal, John is saying, no, he died for our sins, fully God, fully man. So they probably, in those days, some of them accepted that Jesus was uh, a historical figure. They accepted that Jesus was baptized. They accepted perhaps even that Jesus was a wonderful teacher. But they did not accept in full the gospel truth, which was that Jesus died and shed his blood for our sins. Now, the danger is selective belief. And I think some of us are uh, guilty of that as well. The danger in the church of the past and even today is accepting some truths of God but rejecting others. Selectively choosing what you want from the Bible, saying, I will obey these commands, but I won't obey the others. Uh, it is not quite unlike our world today. Uh, forgive me if I've shared this story before, but it gets the point across clearly. Uh, when I was in University of Toronto studying my education. Uh, I studied about Jesus of Nazareth under a professor who was an expert of Jesus, apparently. Uh, this expert of Jesus uh, claimed at the final day of our lecture that she believed that Jesus was indeed a historical figure, that he lived, uh, that he preached, he taught in uh, Nazareth, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, uh, Galilee, and all these places, but that he died, but he, she's not sure whether she, uh, he rose again. She said to the entire class, I believe he's a historical figure. I believe that he was crucified, but I am not sure whether he rose again. You see, this expert of Jesus in University of Toronto did not believe in the complete picture of the gospel. You, you see, sometimes uh, truth is embraced, but only embraced selectively. Uh, when I was in India in this past few months, I was speaking to a lot of the leaders there uh, and I realized that many people, uh, whether in India or perhaps even in Singapore, we accept Jesus, but we don't uh, re uh, receive the complete truth. Uh, in India, they practice very often what is known as syncretic faith. Uh, you know, picking and choosing what they believe about Jesus, but still holding on to their Hindu culture and beliefs and practices. Uh, in India, many churches, uh, if you are of a different caste, you're not really welcome in the church. It's an unspoken tension that happens there. And I wonder whether there's an unspoken tension in our church as well, that certain groups of people are not really welcome in Bethany. Uh, and I wonder whether sometimes uh, our songs and the way we interact uh, tells us about our, our theology. Uh, some of us like to emphasize that Jesus is our best friend, you know, that we are friends of God. Uh, wonderful truth that God says, no longer do you, I call you servants, I call you my friend. But how many of us sometimes go to an extreme that because he's our friend, we can do anything we want because Jesus is our friend, he'll forgive us. Um, and so there is no uh, repentance needed. And sometimes we practice what is known sometimes as hyper grace, that God will forgive me no matter what. Uh, some of us emphasize the idea of health and wealth. And so there's this emphasis on miracles and healings in some circles which we as Christians believe, but it can go to an extreme. Uh, and so a lot of times, sometimes we pick and choose what we believe, that Jesus is for us, so nothing can be against us. And so often, sometimes I look at uh, the presidents of the world, I look at some political leaders, and they claim that God is for them. And I think Abraham Lincoln was right when he said, uh, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side, my concern is whether we are on God's side, <laughs> because God is always right. And so it's very important we have a well-rounded theology, a complete picture of Jesus Christ, and a complete understanding of what he's trying to teach us through Scripture. Uh, I never forget what a friend told me once when I was speaking to him. Um, he said, wow, your Jesus is very different from my Jesus. Uh, and isn't that a very interesting phrase? <laughs> he says, your Jesus, my Jesus, differently. And I'm like, well, I, I thought there's only one Jesus. But... For some reason, we pick and choose, and we have a different image of Jesus in our minds. And I think John is trying to say, look, when he's talking about the Spirit, the water, and the blood, he's saying the testimony is consistent, the testimony is complete. Believe 100% in Jesus Christ, who he is, 
and what he's done for us on the cross. Uh, to the above three testimonies, John completes the, 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 the passage as follows. He says, we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God. And we saw this as we we're looking through the passage just now, especially in the Gospels of Matthew and John. We see that it is God who's testifying that Jesus is the Son of God. And the final verse here at the end says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who, has, who does not have the Son does not have life. Now, there's good news and bad news here, right? The good news is it's very simple, and it's probably what you've heard all along. How do you know you are saved? You know you are saved when you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the one who redeems us. And you know you truly believe Him when that love of God transforms you, and now you're living out that love uh, and loving others as He does as well. May I challenge you that, you know, for a Christian, the litmus test of our faith is not what we say, but what we do and how we live. Now, it is not salvation by works. Please don't misunderstand me. It is salvation because faith, as we like to say, works. And faith uh, responds to God's invitation to the truth of God by living out a, love, a life that is transformed by the love of God. And this looks like joyful obedience. Now, if it feels burdensome, some of us will say, I cannot love because I haven't felt that kind of love before. Uh, I have not loved that way because I don't feel love like that in church. I have not experienced it. How do I respond that way? Uh, may I encourage you, sometimes the miraculous thing about the gospel is as you live out that faith, as you learn to love others, God will uh, awaken that love for him as you love others. Uh, so you don't have to wait till you're overwhelmed and flooded with the love of God before you start loving other people. Uh, sometimes by loving other people, you experience the love of God. Uh, and this sometimes, if it feels like a burden, may I encourage you to pray this morning and say, God, help me lift this burden by first understanding your love for me so that I can love others. Uh, so my prayer for you is that you would be able to love others uh, like a fire that is kindled in your heart and is awakened. Uh, and second, that you would have uncompromising belief. Um, I don't believe that the India problem is just in India. I, I believe it's a human problem. Uh, every single place, we have biases, we have different things that are influencing our faith. Uh, how about the church in Singapore? How about Bethany? Is our belief in Jesus Christ uncompromising. Uh, what areas have been compromised sometimes? Uh, do we still proclaim in 2024 the significance of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary? Or do we simply tell them Jesus is our good friend? I pray that we would not compromise our faith, that we would stand firm in a world that's constantly changing constitutions, uh, in a world that's constantly changing the goalposts, uh, we stand firm and we say, no, the way, the truth, and the life is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters this morning. We thank you because we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. We thank you for your faithfulness and your mercy. And Lord, we could come today not because we chose you, but you first chose us. And so, Lord, we come today humble and ask you to help us to love with a Christ-like love. We ask you to help us to love even when it hurts, because it is not just out of uh, obedience, but it is really out of the joy and that overflow of love that we experience from Christ our Savior. Help us to realize just how much we are loved so that we can share that love to those around us, especially the body of Christ. Lord, we also ask that you help us to stand firm in our faith, to be unwavering, in a world that's constantly changing, that, Lord, you would be our constant, our unchanging um, hope, and that, Lord, you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.